Two of the world's biggest polluters, the US and China, have ratified the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The move is being heralded as a major breakthrough, but does it go far enough? Tom Burke is the chairman of environment think tank E3G and a former British government advisor, and he joins us from central London. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us, Tom. So, Good afternoon. So you've got these two, the biggest polluters, and they've signed up to this accord. How significant is that? Oh, I think it's very significant. They, um, when the first agreement was made in Paris last year, it really came, the momentum for it was built by exactly this sort of thing of America and China as the biggest polluters getting together. They really created a big momentum, so the agreement was made in December. And now that we're going to ratify that agreement, it's the same thing happening again. And that means about... Uh, about half the countries that need to ratify it before it comes into force will uh, have ratified it. So we're really on our way to having this agreement coming into force by the end of the year, which is real progress, especially when you think that this is likely to be the third year in the row that we'll have it as the warmest year ever. So we really do need to get on with things. So when they sign this accord, what actually are they agreeing to, Tom? Well, what they've agreed to is that they will reduce emissions so that we keep the temperature below, well below 2 degrees centigrade, the rise in temperature, well below 2 degrees centigrade, and if possible, try to keep it below 1.5. So it's a very, very ambitious agreement uh, to, as it were, move from a high carbon economy to a low carbon economy and to do it very rapidly indeed. And who's going to hold these countries to account once it all kicks in? I mean, Ban Ki-moon is saying that by the end of the year it should be ratified. So once that happens, who's going to hold these countries to account? Well, one of the things that's important about this agreement is there will be a ratchet mechanism that keeps both lots of transparency in what countries are actually doing and then gets them to meet every few years and wind up their ambition. But the real, the important piece about this agreement is we're changing around from this being you know, where the political risks of doing something on climate change are now going down and the political risks of not doing things are going up. So the underlying equation is changing. So it's easier for governments to get agreement to do the things that are necessary. And also we're seeing the focus of the debate is shifting away from being a debate about how do you stop carbon, a bad thing, coming out of our economy, and how do you actually take advantage of the falling cost of renewables, the falling costs of batteries, to take the opportunities of building a cheaper, cleaner, faster uh, energy system. And I think what we're going to really see is, is much more competition between countries to take advantage of the economic opportunities than people trying to cheat on the commitments they've made. So do you think there is going to be quite a big impact on industry or these positives that you're talking about will actually outweigh any of the negatives? I think that's exactly right, and I think that's a very important message for the fossil fuel industries to take on board so that they, they don't become barriers to what is really a better world that we're building for the future. And it's also important for governments to understand you can't just switch off the existing fossil fuel industries. You've got to help them adjust, uh, as we saw Mrs. Clinton, for instance, doing recently in coal country in the U.S., talking about what you do with uh, the coal miners you'll no longer need. You can't just walk away and abandon them. So we have to start going beyond the piece where we're just thinking about how do you reduce emissions to how do you cope with the social uh, consequences of large-scale transition that we're undergoing. Okay, just finally, Tom, I mean, Obama said it's the first day, well, it's the day we decide to save the planet. Do you think that we're past the point of no return when it comes to these emissions, or we still have hope? I think we still have hope. We have lots of reasons to hope, largely because technology and markets are really delivering for us. We don't really have any technological obstacles to getting to two degrees, and there are no economic obstacles to doing it. It's really about the politics. It's about the change in the pattern of winners and losers that will occur, and how you make sure that the losers don't get in the way of the winners. Okay, Tom, thank you so much. Tom Burke there, the chairman of Third Generation Environmentalism.